Welcome back to the uh, second panel of uh, today's uh, Sustainable Future Summit. Um, I'd uh, like to welcome João Pedro Matos Fernandes, who's Portugal's uh, Environment and Climate Action Minister. Uh, as usual, don't forget to submit your questions and to answer the poll on the Swap Card app. And I'll be keeping an eye on that. So if you do have questions, please do uh, pop them in there and I will make sure that uh, as many of those as possible get uh, get answered. Um, welcome to uh, welcome to the panel. And I'd uh, I'd like to start with uh, with next year's uh, Portuguese Council Presidency. Um, how does the uh, the Green Deal fit in with uh, with Portugal's plans for uh, for its presidency? Well, good morning to you all. I would say that the Green Deal comes after our own Green Deal. Uh, we were the first country in the world to say we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, uh, and after that, we uh, we complete the roadmap uh, for that. Uh, and on on our roadmap, we study three different scenarios. In the scenario that can assure that uh, we'll be carbon neutral by 2050 is the one where the economy grows more. So uh, it means investment. And the European Green Deal fits perfectly in our convictions. Uh, so during the presidency, of course, we will do the best for the European Green Deal. Uh, we have no doubt uh, how important is the, the recovery and resilience plan for all Europe and for all the countries in Europe. Uh, and I can almost say that countries are in very, very uh, compared positions. And we, uh, with this money, with this budget, we can accelerate the measures we are taking because we have no doubt that the economy has to grow but it has to grow with low carbon processes, uh, with recovering uh, all the, the resources that we use and uh, fit inside the limits of the planet Earth. So uh, the, 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 the European Green Deal, it's, uh, it was already the way the economies are supposed to grow and now are the best way for the economies to recover from the pandemic. I guess part of that also depends on uh, on what's going to be happening in Warsaw and Budapest if they if they will actually agree to the uh, to the budget and recovery program. Um, could you spell out a little bit in a little bit more detail about uh, what Portugal has done? Is this uh, is this sort of anchored in law, or is it a is sort of a policy aim, or or how um, uh, wh what are you doing in Portugal to to, to reach these to reach these goals? Essentially, the policy. Uh, we reduced already 26% of our emissions since 2005. Last year, 2019, uh, while Europe uh, reduced in average 4.3% uh, emissions, we reduced it on 8.5%. So we are really in a good way. 57% uh, of the electricity consumed comes already from uh, renewable sources. So, uh, and we uh, read it last Monday, uh, the European Union looking to all the national plans for climate and energy, uh, they wrote that Portugal is, according to them, is Portugal is the country who can have more certainty uh, of uh, achieving its goals for 2030. And we do have important goals, reduce our emissions on 55%, uh, setting a target of 35% for energy efficiency, 80% of the electricity have to come from renewables, and 47% of the gross final energy demand have to come from renewables. We are, or we can be, a lucky country. We have enough wind, water, and sun to produce all the electricity that we need. Of course, the, the connections between countries are very important, and we understand that decarbonization is not the synonymous of electrification. So we, we still uh, need to use gases, and of course, in a country is going to be completely decarbonized, those gases uh, shouldn't be natural gas. They have to be rural gases. That's why before Europe, uh, we... Uh, we promote and we approve uh, a national strategy for hydrogen, for green hydrogen. We will, we will only invest on green hydrogen 
uh, and uh, with the supply uh, of the, that green hydrogen on the economy, uh, we are quite sure that we're going to be carbon neutral. We are doing our best on the transport system. We will reinforce uh, the, the energy efficiency on buildings. And uh, of course, we uh, believe that public opinion uh, is with us. Uh, we are like other countries in Europe, a democracy. Uh, and to make those changes, they have to be uh, very well explained. But I think that people are starting to believe that the sustainability, it's not the thing that we have to be concerned at the end of the day. Sustainability is on the heart of the economy, on the heart of the recovery, uh, and it's impossible, and the pandemic make it very clear, to talk about human health without talking about animal health and environmental health. There's a... A big issue in, in many countries is, I guess, sort of political buy-in. Uh, how do you persuade uh, people who are afraid for their futures? Uh, you know, I'm doing this from Poland, where there's uh, coal miners in Silesia are, are uh, very worried about what's going to happen to their jobs, uh, how they're going to transition to this greener future. How do you, how do, you do uh, the political explanations uh, and sell such policies in a way that you gain uh, sort of a consensus politically and get people who might be quite worried about their futures to buy into this uh, into this vision so they're not terrified of, of, of what's coming uh, what's coming down the, the line at them well I can, I can say that we uh, that this government starts from a good position for two different completely different causes one it's a very good one and the other it's the worst one the first one is that we start a long time ago we start about 20 years ago. When we say that we have 57% of electricity coming from renewable sources, uh, it is not a project from with two or three years. So we are talking about it and we are developing this for uh, almost 20 years. We created 10,000 new jobs on renewables, uh, 3,000 of them in the cluster or in the Neoli cluster in the north of the country, which is very important for the city of Vienna do Castel, where, where the factories are. But the second, so the, it, that was the good, the good reason. The, bad, the, the worst reason is that Portugal is in all Europe, the country who suffers more already with the consequences of uh, climate change. Well, uh, the scatological moment was three years ago with the rural fires on 2017, more than 100 people deceased. And uh, we don't need to, to explain anyone what we are losing on the coastal area. 13 square kilometers were lost uh, on the beaches on the last 20 years. The drop in the south of the country is not circumstantial, it's structural. So uh, people understand very well what are already, repeat, uh, the consequences of climate change. So, uh, and because of that, people have no doubt that things have to change. Of course, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, I would say that the, the, well, we are a, social, a, social, a socialist party, we are very committed with this, but when I look to the liberals who are normally the, 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 the alternative, the, they don't have such an active policy, but they agree with those principles. So uh, I believe that, uh, uh, that many people, and the, mostly the young people, are really engaged with this transformation movement. So do you think that the fires were the crucial point where uh, where normal people saw that that climate change is not just some abstract uh, thing that might be happening in the far Arctic, but that it's actually impacting their everyday lives. Or did that shift politics, or had that already happened before before the fires? Well, I have no doubt that uh, the rural fires uh, show us lots of things. Uh, it's more or less like this. For uh, when the temperature raises 0 0.1 uh, Celsius degrees, the risk of rural fires multiplied by six. 
So uh, when we show these figures to people, uh, they easily understand how important it is well to manage better our forests, of course, but at the same time to be uh, to be one of the leaders in the world, because uh, since we were the leaders in the world, we can uh, be more exigent with the others. Yes, we are already an example. There's a lot of things to do, of course, but we are already an example and we want to do the best to uh, force other countries to say, well, look at us. Uh, we did what we have to do when, when we talk about mitigation, but we still suffer a lot when we talk about adaptation. So uh, you have your own responsibilities, do the same as we do. How do you see the politics uh, playing out over the course of the, uh, the Portuguese presidency? Uh, to get all the countries to agree to this higher uh, 2030 ambition. And how do you see uh, June's uh, Fit for 55 package from the Commission fitting into that political push to, uh, to get uh, a sign-on by all, by all uh, 27 EU countries? Well, we do believe that we will approve that the European Union will approve the Council will approve uh, the, the 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 climate law during this year, and the at least fifty five percent. It's really the best the best compromise that we can have between all the countries and at the same time between the Council and the European Parliament. Uh, the Just Transition Fund, it's really important in here to help countries who are in worse conditions. You talked uh, talk about uh, Poland on the, 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 the previous questions. But uh, I, I believe uh, what is more important in here, it's not just money. We are not a rich country and we did it. So at the same time that we, uh, and of course, I understand perfectly why Poland needs more money than Portugal to make this transition and to, 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 to want that transition is a fair one. But uh, I believe, uh, and when I look to the national uh, energy and climate plans, that there are some political commitments still lacking in here. Uh, of course, I'm very proud uh, as a Portuguese minister uh, when I look to the ranking uh, of, the, of the countries uh, made by the European Commission and when they look to the plans and they say that Portugal will be the leader in both, uh, both conditions. If we, simply, uh, if we simply project in the future the same that we did in the past, we'll be the leaders. And if we did what we say that is important to do inside the plan, we'll be a leader with, with a big distance from the others. But when I look at the full ranking, what I see is that uh, the plans are not, uh, they, 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 suffer for, they suffer from lack of credibility. So uh, as a, as a future president of the council, of, at least for a semester, I'm really concerned because uh, uh, I have no doubt that European countries are the, the most, are the bloc most committed with, uh, with the energy transition, but there are lots of things to do in the near future. Which, uh, which countries do you think are the ones that have the biggest problem with, uh, with meeting those those goals and which ones will you really have to work on during your uh, your presidency? Well, uh, the countries who depend a lot on carbon, uh, on coal, sorry, on coal, and uh, the countries who have coal mines, uh, they are mostly in the Western Europe, in the Eastern Europe, sorry, uh, and uh, those. Those are the countries who have to do more, that's true, who need more money in better conditions, it's also true. Uh, they have, uh, they are in the, in the most difficult position. Uh, but when I look to countries in the uh, Scandinavia and countries like Portugal, Spain and France, uh, I think that the Europe as a whole will be in a, in a good path to a better future. Um uh, Commissioner Simpson uh, talked a little bit about this uh, during during our earlier chat, but um, 
Do you uh, do you think that the uh, the incoming Biden presidency in the United States does that change the dynamic uh, for these these efforts? Does Europe feel slightly less alone uh, in in pushing in pushing these issues? Yes, we all can. Uh, I believe that it's really uh, an important chance. Well, let me stress one thing. It's very obvious that Mr. Trump wants to stay on the wrong side of history when we talk about climate action. But that's also true that the United States, uh, well, they change lots of regulations in the, in the worst direction, but that's true that during the, the last four or five years, they reduce emissions. And in a big democracy like the United States, the country is much more than its administration. So uh, many states like California were uh, the champions of the, the, the change that we need. Cities like New York and many others, they never leave, in fact, uh, the Paris Agreement. So things were not so bad as people believe that it was. But, uh, well, Mr. Joe Biden, he said that on the first day that uh, after being a president, the, the day after, uh, the first thing that he's supposed to do is to say yes to Paris Agreement. It's really important that people and countries say yes to Paris Agreement. Of course, the United States is a big economy. It's a country very, very influent in the world. Uh, what doesn't happen five years ago when uh, Mr. Trump decide to leave, I think that it's going to be, it will happen now. Many countries who leave uh, and who have very important relations and commercial relations with the United States would leave uh, Paris Agreement and it won't happen. So, and the next year, uh, and the, the end of this year and next year, it's really important. Uh, I think that you all know that uh, Paris Agreement is not enough. Uh, it's a multilateral uh, agreement, a, a brilliant agreement with a, a very, very important role of French diplomacy. But each five years, countries have to commit more to the best. And uh, next 12th of December, it's the, the fifth anniversary, uh, anniversary of Paris Agreement. So we, uh, all the countries have to present till the end of the year a more ambitious uh, agenda. Uh, so uh, that's why the next COP in Glasgow, it's key uh, for the future of Paris Agreement. And we, the United States inside, things uh, will really go better. Uh, we still have problems, yes. What's going to happen with Brazil? How they will commit? We don't know. Uh, what's going to happen with Russia? How they will commit? We don't know uh, either. So uh, there are many uh, things to be discussed. Many countries who have different opinions. Uh, the democracy, it's really this. Uh, but uh, with Mr. Joe Biden and Mr. John Kerry, who I was with him, I have the honor to be with him. Uh, we signed at the same time the Paris Agreement on the UN in New York. I think that they are really, really in a good direction. Uh, Portugal has uh, a unique relationship with, uh, with Brazil. Uh, do you uh, intend to use the, the leverage of, your, uh, of the presidency to try to influence or to talk to the Brazilian government on these climate and uh, biodiversity issues uh, where they are, I guess, an outlier uh, to, to what we're seeing uh, other countries doing right now? We definitely will. Uh, and we have already offered uh, our services, if I can say so, to the uh, COP presidency. But uh, yes, we have a very good relationship. We are countries who speak the same language with very strong uh, political, cultural, uh, economic relations. But uh, Brazil, it's a, it's a country uh, with their own government. Uh, and we offer, we will do our best, but we can't give no warranties of what's going to happen. Um, the, the presidency has also talked about um, making Africa a focus over the, uh, the upcoming six months. How does, uh, 
uh, how does the climate and the Green Deal issue play out in that in that outreach to Africa that you that you plan to be doing? When we look to the next few decades, uh, Africa uh, it's the key continent. Uh, we are more or less seven billion people uh, on Earth. And the statistics say that we are supposed to be 10, 10, 10 B uh, on uh, 2015. And the big uh, growth in population will happen in Africa. 10 of the biggest cities in the world in 2050 won't be in China, but in Africa. And the African countries uh, with a, a huge potential uh, uh, are... Uh, that's, that's very uh, easy to, to look when you look to the statistics, are the countries who uh, have to do more to bring welfare to their own citizens. And all the world have to be very focused in helping uh, African countries to reach our levels of well-being, of course, without uh, going through uh, the fossil uh, energy and uh, without insist in a linear way of a uh, linear model of economy. Portugal have important responsibilities in here. Uh, we have very strong relations with countries like Mozambique or Angola. Uh, I, I live already in Mozambique. I work there, uh, managing a port in the north of the country of Mozambique called Nakala. Uh, I have very good friends in Mozambique. Uh, and we, uh, we have a fund, an environmental fund, which uh, have a, a part for cooperation projects with countries who speak Portuguese in Africa, uh, with, a, well, for a country like Portugal, an important budget each year. And we help them in Cape, in Cape Verde, in uh, San Tome, uh, and, uh, and uh, in Guinea Bissau, and in Mozambique to help, to help them to develop projects to uh, fight climate change. Uh, and to solve some basic problems. Uh, they have problems of uh, water scarcity, uh, not because it doesn't rain a lot, it rains a lot, but because they have very fragile infrastructures. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to take a question that's just come in uh, here from uh, Josep uh, Albrecht. Is energy decarbonization enough? Should the EU and Portugal consider more approaches as donut economics, degrowth, or a bioeconomy strategy? So sorry, you have to repeat. Sure. Yeah. Um, is uh, is uh, decarbonization enough? And should the EU and Portugal consider different approaches, such as uh, what he calls donut economics, degrowth, or a bioeconomy strategy, which I guess the implication being that uh, a need to rethink uh, conventional economics uh, in light of the uh, the need to transform the uh, the energy picture. Of you. Tira a máscara. Give me just one minute. Well, I'm not so sure that I understood the question. You are talking about uh, the the energetic sector. Uh, well, we have no problems uh, in here, uh, no specific problems. Uh, in the past, we have to uh, support the change from fossil fuels to, to renewable sources. Uh, and uh, in the present, uh, what was the cost in the past, in the present, it is not. Uh, we, uh, last years, well, this year and uh, the previous one, we have two different options to produce electricity from solar, and we, uh, at, uh, on both of the auctions, we have uh, a world record on low price. Uh, so uh, it's very easy to show anyone that uh, we will produce, uh, that it's cheaper to produce electricity from uh, renewable sources. Uh, compared with fossil fuels. So sorry, I didn't hear the question. No, that's, that's, that's not a problem. Um, Commissioner Simpson had also talked, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, green hydrogen, which I understand plays a role in the Portuguese strategy as well. Um, one of the issues is that for the moment, uh, it's 
significantly more expensive than uh, than hydrogen produced from from natural gas. Do you think that it uh, that it makes sense to include hydrogen as a, a future fuel? That that technology that the prices will be beaten down to a level where it becomes economically viable. If you build. Well, that's true that green hydrogen, uh, on the first moment, it's more expensive than natural gas. It's also true that natural gas will have its price, will raise the price on the next years because of the, the, the carbon uh, taxes. Uh, I can give you just one example. Uh, in Portugal, when before I was a minister, uh, to produce electricity from carbon, pay no tax from, from coal, sorry, pay no taxes. They don't pay taxes. Everyone was very concerned with the help that we gave to renewable sources, but no one talks about it. Well, we didn't put them put it paying 100% uh, of, the, of the taxes on the first year, but we start with 10%, 25 and when we reach the 50% of the taxes, well, next year, the coal uh, uh, production will stop in Portugal. It's much more expensive than renewable. So if we have fair uh, rules, things will happen like this. Yes, on the beginning, the green hydrogen will be more expensive than the natural gas. The natural gas will, will have to pay more taxes. Uh, and it's not just a Portuguese decision. I, was, I can almost say that it's a world decision, but it's at least an European decision, and they will pay more in the near future. And the green hydrogen, uh, as the technology becomes ordinary, uh, they, uh, they, they, the, the price will decrease. That's true that for 10 years, uh, in a very transparent way, and always with auctions, when we talk, well, there are many uh, value chains when you think on green hydrogen. But there's one, which is uh, put green hydrogen in the, in the grid. And uh, with a very transparent and with auctions, we will support not thinking on those who are going to produce, but thinking on the consumer, we will support at least a part of the, the cost difference. difference. Great, thanks. And as a, a final question, um, there's a lot of talk about the EU becoming more resource independent, and one of those initiatives has led to uh, a lithium mine uh, opening in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, there's been a lot of political tensions around that that project. Uh, do you think that this is a realistic initiative? There's other, you know, there's a Swedish project to to open a rare earths mine in in uh, in north central Sweden. Uh, is this is this realistic, or or is the, does is the EU going to have to rely on uh, resources and potentially technology developed in other parts of the world in order to make this green transition? Well, you put the question uh, really in the right way. Uh, can we live without lithium? No. There's lithium in here. There's lithium in the, 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 the computer, the laptop that I have in front of me. So, can we live with, with lithium? No. And can people who are against the exploration of lithium live without it? Well, I think that the, the answer is very obvious. Also, no. Europe has only 9% of the critical resources for its economy. 9%. And lithium is one of them. Uh, so we have to explore the lithium that we have. We don't have a, a mining project for Portugal. We have an industrial project who starts with the exploration of the mineral, with its, uh, we have to transform it, we have to produce cells, and we have to produce batteries. And of course, we have to recycle those batteries. This is the complete project. There are uh, many ways of exploring lithium. Uh, if you ask me, does Portugal have a good track record on mining exploring in the past, Portugal or other countries? I, can, I have to confess and to say no, no, we don't have. 
No, we don't have. There are many wounded on the on the uh, on the landscape, uh, and uh, it's impossible to do it on the uh, in the future. But we can never win the future using the the processes of the past. So the green mining exists. Uh, there are no difference between an exploration of lithium or any other metals. Uh, it's very, I, I don't know the name in English, maybe it's not very different from Portugal. Feldspat is a part of, uh, it's very important to do, to do ceramics, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a mine of this uh, other uh, material, it's exactly the same and works exactly the same as the lithium mine. We have 64 mines of that other material, important for ceramics. They work perfectly, no one's against, but people don't want lithium. Well, I, I really don't understand it. Of course, it's also my fault. I have to do better. But uh, I simply don't understand why people are against a thing that is so obviously important for... Uh, <clears throat> for the things that they use today and for the future. We, uh, um, we do believe that to, to talk about decarbonization, we have at the same time to talk and do the best on digitalization because it's the only way uh, those two things have to work together for a better future. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for agreeing to the interview this morning. Um, I certainly think that you have a challenging presidency ahead with uh, convincing some of the more carbon-heavy countries to uh, put their skepticism aside and, uh, and sign on for the, uh, for the uh, 2030 uh, target. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the audience uh, for tuning in to, uh, to the second panel of the day. Um, in 10 minutes' time, please join my uh, colleague, uh, Kalina Orashakov who uh, will be leading a panel discussion on the uh, European Green Deal. In the meantime, please explore the Summit's app and book some meetings with your peers. Thank you very much.